then to rise to such heights, to be, if I'm hearing it properly, the most famous Irishman maybe in the world at the time. And the idea of I mean, what drove him forward? Was there something in that background in Dublin that, 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 that accounts for this, this, this astonishing rise? So he, he felt very deeply, I think, this, this sense of his family having come down in the world and of expectations that could not be fulfilled in the world that he lived in. Mm-hmm. And so what he did was he, he invented a persona. He was a shy, awkward, not particularly well-educated person who hadn't got particularly even great connections because... Of course, he hadn't been to university. You know, if you were going to go, so like Oscar Wilde goes to England, but he goes to university first. So you, you, have a, you have a network, you have a whole group of people that you know, you have a confidence. And Shaw arrives as just this, this outsider. And um, he, he discovers, however, that there's a, there's a theatrical trick, which is you, you create a persona. Theatre isn't just what Shaw does on the stage. It's, it's really what he creates in his life. So, so he invents GBS. And GBS is unlike Shaw, supremely confident, knows everything, wow. has uh, an absolute opinion about everything, might be, remind you of somebody, uh, you know, is, is um, f- fully at ease in front of audiences. And so, so it's really important to remember that he invents himself as an orator first which actually interestingly places him in a very old yeah. Irish Protestant tradition, the great oratorical yeah. tradition yeah. that goes back yeah. to Edmund Burke and Sheridan in the 18th century, Grattan, you know. Um, but, but he doesn't, he's not in Parliament. He's, he, he does it on the street. I mean, he, yeah. he goes to Hyde Corner. He, he's a passionate socialist. And it's, it's through politics and through the, pr- the presentation of this political persona that, that he invents himself. And then he becomes known. So GBS, the, the, that, that sort of, uh, it's, it's a pen name that appears initially to do with his, with his, 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 his criticism. So he's one of the very few examples, really, of, of a professional critic um, who becomes famous for a start. Critics usually aren't famous. And then a, a critic who, who, who ultimately becomes an artist. He's a music critic first. So he knows music. That's the thing he ah. knows about. And he uses that to get himself into the newspapers, to write in a new way about classical music, about opera. It's entertaining and funny and sharp and provocative. And then he writes and, about and was the there something in his Irish background in Dublin that, that, that brought him to music? Or where does that come in? Music? So, so it, it, you can't really understand Shaw without understanding the musical background. And the musical background goes back to, I mentioned the mother's music teacher, right? who's this extraordinary mm. character himself who's actually worth a... Um, you know, a, a, a book himself called Vandalair Lee, George Lee, who calls himself Vandalair Lee. And he's also a self-made man. He's an extraordinary character. He's, he's ostensibly his father's a coal man in Dublin. His mother's a, you know, a housewife or whatever in Dublin. Catholic, uh, poor, but he gets an education. So somebody gives some money for him to go to the Christian Brothers and gets a secondary education. And he, he himself says that he is the illegitimate, as the, the phrase used at the time, uh, son of Lord Vandalaire, who was a big Protestant landowner in, in County Clare, which may well be the case because somebody comes up with some money. And he's a musical genius. He, 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 you know, he, he plays the violin, but he's, he, in particular, he invents a method of musical education. Hmm. He's Henry Higgins. So if you know um, My Fair Lady or Pygmalion, which we will we'll talk about later, the apparatus in um, Henry Higgins' studio, you know, the, the, right. the sounds, all that stuff. Right. This guy, Lee, really invents his own system, which, by the way, is called The Method. Right? So, so before Lee Strasberg, everybody else, he has The <laughs> Method. And he's, he's extraordinarily successful and, and, and in demand. One of his um, students is Shaw's mother who had married the father thinking he was going to be a rich um, Protestant gentleman <laughs> and uh, had given up her own musical education. She was a very fine singer. Uh, and as part of their kind of settlement, she, he, she's allowed to go and study with Vandalaire Lee. After about a year, Vandalaire Lee is holding his classes in the Shaw home. And then after another year, they've all moved in together in this menage a trois in, a, in Lee's house in, in, in Harrington Street around the corner. So 
Lee is a huge figure for Shaw, but but Shaw says, looking back, that by, by the time he was 10 years old, he could whistle three entire operas. Oh, wow. You wow. know, he absorbed music and musical structure. Mm. Wow. And that is really, so he, he really does know about music. So when, when he comes to write about it, he adopts the persona of a sort of average Joe, if you'll excuse the, the, the I'm sure there's no such thing as an average Joe, of course, but uh, <laughs> he adopts that persona, <laughs> average middle class guy who's going to the opera, who's going to, you know, the, the classical music concerts, but he's, he's adopting his persona, but, but I, I don't really know anything about this, but, and then he'll explain to you exactly why counterintuitively it's easier to sing Wagner than it is to sing Verdi. Uh, and people who know about opera, will, who've read the stuff, will say he's absolutely right. I mean, he knows everything about wow. this stuff. So he works very hard. He's very, he's very adept. He's, he's just incredibly smart. Um, but but the musical thing is is incredibly important to him, you know. And and uh, and the other thing he gets in Dublin is the National Gallery. So people who know Dublin, if you've ever been to the National Gallery in Dublin, on your way in, you're going to see the big statue of Bernard Shaw. Why? Because he left a huge amount of his money to the National Gallery in, in Dublin. Why? Because instead of an education, he, he used to go in and sit in front of the paintings and, and look at the old masters, you know. Um, and so his, his sense of Dublin is very much tied up with its musical culture. So he's very like Joyce in, in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and then this visual culture of of the gallery. Okay. Those are the things that he, he treasures mm -hmm. about his, mm -hmm. his, his, his youth. Know, the one thing, Vinton, about that, that edu early education, though, is that clearly when he's a relatively young man, it is, he goes with his mother to London, and while he espouses Irish causes, he's gone. Is he, is he a British writer or is he an Irish writer? Well, he, he, he would have strangled you if he said he was a British writer, you know, so... so Wouldn't be the first person. I, I, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I think we can allow him a self-identification in this regard, you know, which is, which is that he insists all his life, I mean, he, he insists, I am an Irish person, I'm an Irish writer, you know. Um, and, and, I mean, to the extent that, you know, late in life, when, when Pandit Nehru, who's the first Prime Minister of India, comes to see him, and it's interesting, that's how famous Shaw is, by the way. One of, when, when Nehru pays his first visit as Indian prime minister, he, he pays it to go to see Shaw, you know, to go to, to Shaw's house as a, a pilgrimage to Shaw, you know. But Shaw says to him, you know, I, I have always felt all my life in England as foreign as you were when, when you were wow. a student. You know, I, I'm a foreigner. And of course, this is very important to him because that's the stand, that's what GBS is. It's the outsider who, you know, is, is playing with you, who is subverting you, who will sort of, you know, make you laugh, but at the same time is mocking you and is make, you know, trying to make you think about what you're doing. That, that's his, 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 his persona. So his Irishness is very important to him from that perspective. Uh, it's also, he, he does actually think it. Um, you, you know, if you, if, if you listen to him, for example, Mm. Uh, which we can do because, you know, he, he, he appeared a lot on radio and, and newsreels late in his life. I mean, it's almost like somebody making up an Irish accent. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, it's a very soft Irish accent. Like, you know, my name is yeah. Bernard Shaw. Yeah. And, yeah. but yeah. If, you, if you listen to, Bert, to um, Samuel Beckett, I mean, it's very hard to get uh, audio of Beckett, but it's the same accent. It's a, Dublin Protestant Irish accent. And that's what Shaw is. He's a Dublin Protestant Irish nationalist. And, you know, he writes late in his life, he, he, he has to deal with um, Eamon de Valera about something, you know, a piece of legislation. But he writes to de Valera saying, you know, I was a Fenian long before you were. <laughs> you know? I, I, and he says, you know, I was, a, I was a Fenian as a child. He doesn't say I was a nationalist, I was a Fenian. And, and all his life, you know, he, he identifies very strongly with, with, with the cause of Ireland, as, as well as a lot of other causes. But it, it's, it is important to him that he is an Irish writer. He takes out Irish citizenship as soon as it's possible to do it, you know. So I think, I think we can allow him that self-identification.
That's, that's, that's really wonderful, actually. And as, as the, the famous line, I think, that most Irish people, if you stop them in the street and ask them if they knew anything that Shaw had actually said, it was that wonderful line, actually, after the death of Michael Collins, when he yes. told people to hang out your brightest colours, indeed. And I think he had met Collins only a short time before. They, they had actually... Yes, yes, you know, he... he so, I mean, he's... Apart from everything else, you know, he's a very interesting figure in terms of the history of Irish nationalism, you know, because he, he's a sort of protean figure in terms of what should Irish nationalism mean, you know. Um, and there's yeah. two things he has no time for, right? And this is why, if we're thinking about the Nobel laureates, like himself and Yeats is, is a very interesting kind of relationship. But, you know, he has no time for, the, for any ethnic idea of Irishness. Why? Because he can't. He's a, you know, he's a descendant of people that came over with William of Orange, you know, but he's not one of them either. You know, so he started, as, you know, to use a phrase that might have been used at the time, deracinated in that sense, right? So, so, so how, how do you be Irish then? Well, you know, so he has to invent a different way of being Irish, which has nothing to do with, with the Gaelic Ireland. Um, he sort of mocks the Irish language. When, when he finally gives a speech in Dublin, when he comes back to Dublin in 1911, gives a big public speech, a big, a huge public occasion. He's by far the most famous Irish person on the planet that maybe has ever been. Um, and he, 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 he says, you know, um, you know you, you, you're all going on about the, the, you know, how you'd love to hear the Irish language in the mouths of the Dublin poor. Have you ever thought about the teeth in their mouths? You know, have you ever thought about, <laughs> you know, like, you know, when you think about public health, you know, <laughs> you know typically provocative. But so he's not, he's not part of the Gaelic revival. And of course, he'll, he'll mock it to some extent in, in John Bull's Other Island. Um, but, but he's also not part of, of uh, any notion of Irish independence for, his, for its own sake. So, so what he keeps saying is, what do you want it for? <laughs> what is it you want to do when you're independent? He writes a great letter to, um, to Mabel Fitzgerald, who is the mother of Gareth Fitzgerald, who people might remember was, was Taoiseach, um, rather later, <laughs> of course. Uh, and Mabel was very active, a very radical Irish nationalist, you know, very, very involved in Sinn Féin, who was his secretary for a period. And, and when she was back in Ireland and engaged in the revolutionary movements, he writes to her saying, you know, what are you going to do when you get freedom? Are you going to sit around and wait for the turf to run out in Donegal? You know, is, wow. is that it? Mm. So, so, so what he's trying to say is, what's the content of, of Irish independence? And in that sense, he's very close to, he's much closer to a figure like James Connolly, for example. You know, he's a socialist. He's saying, you know, y y yes, Ireland must be free, but it must be free to do good things with its, its newfound power and to do them for its ordinary people. So he would have agreed completely with Connolly's thing, but you know, Connolly said, that, you know, Ireland without its people means nothing to me. Mm -hmm.